Thanks everyone for joining us today. This webinar is part of our QTalk series where we interview thought leaders from Cambridge and beyond. I'm Edward Kosaku. And I'm Vali, and we'll be your hosts um, this morning or this afternoon. Um, we are very, very happy and honored to have a very special guest today with us, Pagita Wiriawan. We will hear from Pagita about his thoughts on Southeast Asian economy for the first 20 minutes or so. And during this time, please feel free to post the questions in the chat. Um, Edward and I will ask Pagita in the final 40 minutes of this webinar. This webinar is presented to you by the Cambridge University Technology and Enterprise Club, or QTech in short. QTech was founded in October 2003 and our mission is to foster vibrant research and entrepreneurial communities at the University of Cambridge. Please do check our website at www.qtech.io and do send us an email as well. And today's webinar is the third live event that is organized as part of our QTalks, one of our flagship programs where we interview thought leaders from Cambridge and beyond. We are a leading podcast series for tech founders and aspiring innovators. We have had over 30 incredible guests so far, including founders, investors, and experts. So if you are feeling bored during the summer or just looking for new content, do check out our podcast at the link shown in the screen, or you can also scan the QR code. Our guest today is none other than Pagita Wehiawan the former Minister of Trade of Indonesia, and also the chairman of Ancora Group, an Indonesian business group which he founded in 2008 with a diverse range of interests from private equity investing, natural resources, sports, real estate, and music. Now, Pagita was also the former head of the National Badminton Association of Indonesia, which explains this picture on the left-hand side here. And we're all looking forward to see and hear what he thinks about COVID-19, the US-China trade war, and the Southeast Asian economy. So without further ado, uh, the stage is yours, Pagita. Okay, uh, thank you uh, guys for allowing me to speak uh, this afternoon in Jakarta and this morning in the UK and this late morning in the Northern American continent. Uh, I wanna just basically spend the next few minutes talking about the history of Southeast Asia. Thereafter, I'll start talking about how the COVID-19 has and is likely to continue affecting the Southeast Asian region. Uh, and I'll talk also a little bit about how the post uh, COVID-19 world is likely to look and how it's gonna affect Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and how Southeast Asia is going to be affected by other exogenous, uh, you know, events or forces. If we uh, can move to uh, the next page. Uh, next. Next. So the, the planet has been around for about four and a half. Oh, uh, we could go back to the earlier page. The planet has been around for about four and a half billion years. Uh, and things uh, started shaping up by way of the simple life form, which basically took place about you know, 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, and as things got a little more complicated, uh, we started seeing the formation of uh, complex life forms uh, about 700 million years ago. And uh, Shortly thereafter, about 480 million years ago, came about the lobsters, uh, which have outlived, uh, you know, even the dinosaurs. Uh, and about a million years ago, uh, we came across a guy by the name of Java Man. And Java Man was basically, uh, you know, the spillover of what might have been the Homo sapiens that would have traveled from Africa uh, all the way through Asia and all the way to uh, you know, parts, if not many parts of Southeast Asia. And um, fast forward to the last uh, two millennia, uh, in the last 2000 years, uh, I think Southeast Asia uh, has been blessed uh, by way of being graced by uh, a number of events, uh, a number of people, a number of, uh, you know, civilizing 
influences uh, and also a number of uh, factors. Uh, if we take a look at the next page, uh, for about 400 years, uh, Southeast Asia was grazed by Buddhism. Uh, this would have been between the 7th and the 11th centuries. And immediately thereafter, Southeast Asia was predominantly grazed by Hinduism uh, for about 600 years. Uh, and thereafter, Southeast Asia has been graced by what we have known as colonialism. Uh, then on, uh, you know, Christianity, Islam, and then independence. And in the last few decades, I think a uh, number of countries uh, in Southeast Asia have gone through what, what we call uh, democratization. Uh, and, and I could argue that the last 2,000 years of uh, Southeast Asian history uh, has been blessed with uh, relative peace and stability. And these, I think, would serve as capital for the region of Southeast Asia to basically remain not only peaceful and stable, uh, but I do believe that, you know, at the rate that we've been able to show stability and growth uh, thus far, and at the rate that we're going to be able to continue showing uh, stability and also growth uh, in the next few decades, uh, I think Southeast Asia is only likely to be uh, a more relevant uh, region vis-a-vis uh, -vis or with respect to the rest of the world. Uh, the next page. Uh, next. We have experienced uh, something spectacular in the last few months on an unprecedented basis. Uh, some might argue that this is a black swan, but I would argue that this is a white swan, uh, something that actually could have been prevented uh, had we actually taken the, the necessary precautionary steps. Uh, consequently, uh, we're seeing more than 13 million people that have been affected uh, all across the world. Uh, with a mortality rate of about 4.3%. Uh, we have seen some spikes uh, in a number, a number of uh, countries, particularly in Western Europe, uh, in the UK, where the mortality rate has been above 15%, uh, and also in countries like Spain and France. Uh, and uh, in Asia, we are seeing a bit of a contrast uh, uh, in most countries where I think we've been able to uh, manage uh, the degree of transmission and also the mortality rate. Uh, in China, uh, we're only seeing, uh, you know, a mortality rate of about 5.5%. But if we deep dive into the Southeast Asia region, uh, which is uh, represented by a number of countries that I've illustrated on this page, uh, i.e. Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines, we're seeing varying uh, behaviors in terms of how we've been able to uh, not only uh, you know see the infection uh, going but also how we've been able to manage the mortality rates. Uh, Singapore uh, as much as you know at the early stage uh, has believed that uh, you know to be one of the better countries in managing but uh, unfortunately they've gone through you know one or two episodes uh, with regards to the foreign workers, uh, whereby the transmission rate has, has gone up uh, to a pretty high uh, level. But they've been able to, I think, quite efficiently and effectively manage the mortality rate to 0.1%, uh, which is slightly above you know, what Vietnam has been doing. And, and I think uh, Vietnam is a standout in terms of managing the coronavirus uh, you know, episodes uh, and also uh, managing the mortality rate. Indonesia, uh, unfortunately, is a bit on the high side with more than 80,000 people being affected and infected uh, and, and, you know, with a mortality rate of around 4.7%. But I do want to highlight uh, that, you know, there's varying degrees of testing being done by, you know, the Southeast Asian countries where, you know, Singapore has been testing more than 170,000 people on a per million basis, uh, whereas countries like Indonesia has only been testing... Uh, you know, slightly over 4,000 people on a per 1 million basis. Uh, and Vietnam, almost similarly, uh, at, you know, 2,800 people on a per 1 million basis. Uh, and the Philippines at 9,000 uh, people on, on a per 1 million basis. So I, I, I could also argue that the rate of testing uh, in, in any country, I think, correlates with uh, the degree of transmission of, of the COVID-19 virus. So as, as we speak, uh, the different governments and economies uh, in Southeast Asia are dealing with the COVID-19 episode uh, in varying degrees. If we go to the next page, 
mix. I think it's safe to assume that uh, there is uh, likely to be some attributes that will color the uh, post-COVID era. Uh, uh, the obvious one would be the slowing, uh, if not the compression of aggregate demand that we're seeing uh, all over the world. Uh, and I think the decreased aggregate demand is only likely to entail a deceleration of economic growth, uh, you know, probably starting 2021. Uh, whereas in 2020, I think we're likely to see a global kind of contraction, uh, you know, in just about every economy around the world. Uh, we hope there are going to be some exceptions, uh, not only in Asia, but in other parts of the world. Uh, but I think we can assume and conclude overall the, the world economy is going to go through a contractionary period in 2020, followed on uh, with, uh, you know, some sort of a rebound. But there is, uh, again, likely to be a deceleration of economic growth because of the um, drop in, in aggregate demand, globally speaking. Uh, the second attribute uh, would be the decreased productivity, and this would be largely uh, because of the disruption of the supply chain. Uh, we have uh, been hearing uh, nuances uh, in a number of developed economies uh, with respect to deglobalizing the supply chain or even reshoring you know, the supply chain from China to their respective countries. Uh, Southeast Asia, uh, I think, could be a beneficiary of this uh, type of deglobalization of the supply chain. Uh, but, but I do believe if it were to happen, I think it would take uh, quite some time. Uh, and, and I think it would be a combination of not only the, the willingness and the readiness of the multinational companies to actually deglobalize, uh, but it, it would also require the, the preparatory steps that would need to be taken by uh, you know, the Southeast Asian countries that need to be ready to basically facilitate uh, the relocation of these manufacturing capabilities. The third attribute that's going to color the post-COVID era would be the, the higher degree that, uh, you know, an individual is likely to lever up uh, and also the higher degree that corporations are likely to lever up. And also at the national level where governments have been borrowing uh, either from each other or also from, you know, external sources uh, so that they could actually fill up uh, the fiscal space a bit more as to come up with the necessary uh, social safety nets uh, and anything that's necessary to make sure that the, both the supply side and the demand side of the economy uh, would be uh, preserved uh, going forward. The fourth would be the fact that, you know, uh, you know just about every business model out there is going to have to go through the adaptation as to embrace uh, a lot more of the virtual and digital paradigm. Uh, I think it is safe to assume that some uh, businesses or some business models that are not likely to be able to make this adaptation, uh, I think, would, would be exposed to a pretty uh, severe uh, risk uh, of, of basically uh, stopping, uh, if not slowing, uh, in the near foreseeable future. The fifth attribute uh, would be a result of what I'm seeing uh, with respect to a number of developed economies where they have been basically printing money and they fancily call it uh, quantitative easing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of this liquidity that, that, that's been pumped uh, by the central banks of uh, the respective countries uh, has been trapped and stuck in uh, you know, a lot of the capital markets instruments to the extent that it actually does not trickle all the way down to the lowest levels of uh, the respective economies. So this, I think, is going to cause a bit more concern uh, by way of the increase in the gap between the inflation of financial assets and also the inflation of uh, the real economy. Uh, the sixth attribute that we're likely to see, uh, I think potentially could be a, a cycle of uh, low inflation for a long time and potentially a cycle of deflation. And this would be triggered, uh, if not driven, uh, by how technology has played a role in basically compressing uh, cost uh, in a big way. Uh, and also the fact that, you know, savings all over the world uh, is likely to go up uh, and while the number of uh, asset classes is only likely to remain uh, finite uh, so that the cost of capital is only going to come down. But at the rate that demographically people are not going to get any younger, uh, they're only going to be 
uh, less consumptive while they hold on to more cash. So the less uh, consumptive propensity that we're likely to see in the future, I think is only gonna entail uh, a low inflation uh, period, uh, if not potentially deflationary period. Uh, the seventh um, attribute uh, would be basically the increase of polarization in conversations, uh, whether you stay on a far right or you stay on a far left. And I think I could argue that this is empirically correlated with how inequality has risen in not just uh, you know, developing economies, but also in developed economies uh, where the haves uh, you know, just continue to have a lot more. Uh, either absolutely or relatively, and have not, uh, you know, continue to have less uh, absolutely and relatively, uh, and and I think this is going to further complicate conversations to the extent that you know uh, they there is likely to be more uh, protectionism in in more countries than not. The last uh, attribute that's likely to color the post COVID nineteen, I think, would be. Uh, the increasing decoupling uh, between China and the U.S. Uh, uh, I, I, I honestly do not know how this thing will affect uh, Southeast Asia, but, but I do believe uh, Southeast Asia, given the fact that it's got 650 million people, over $3 trillion economy, uh, and some countries uh, within the region are actually, uh, you know, robust uh, democracies. I think we've got a chance to basically stay on as, as a true, meaningful uh, middle power to the extent that we can actually be friends with both the, uh, the, the, the United States and China. So if we go to the next page, uh, I want to just uh, peel the onion a little bit about how uh, each country in Southeast Asia is uh, I know there's a lot of numbers and figures here, but I just want to highlight, uh, you know, the column that says marginal productivity, and it's the second uh, from the left uh, column, uh, where we see Singapore and Brunei uh, as being standouts uh, at a marginal productivity on a PPP adjusted basis of 150,000 and 140,000 respectively. Uh, whereas Indonesia stands at a mere $23,000 uh, on a per person basis, on a PPP adjusted basis, uh, as compared to the Chinas and Japans and South Koreas of the world uh, with, you know, over 28,000 for China and over 74,000 for Japan and over 67,000 for South Korea. So uh, I think the view taking for some member countries of Southeast Asia uh, would be that in order for us to basically maintain peace and stability uh, and also in order for us to actually uh, thrive in a robust manner, we've got to actually take a hard look at how we can actually improve our respective marginal productivity figures in the 10 different countries in Southeast Asia. So the key drivers for marginal productivity in any country, and particularly Southeast Asia, I think would be uh, relevant with three things. The first one would be the fiscal space and how we're actually going to be able to continue collecting uh, taxes uh, and how we're actually going to be able to use that tax revenue for educational purposes. Uh, the second would be financial inclusion and how we're going to actually be able to get everybody uh, in each country to have access to capital. Uh, Indonesia, unfortunately, only has a financial inclusion of only 49% um, as compared to Singapore's 98% uh, and Malaysia. Uh, at 85% and Thailand at 82%. But I'm a believer that this 49% figure for Indonesia is a number that's likely to actually go up, uh, you know, very, very quickly in the next five years, at least, uh, by way of the digitization uh, that we're seeing, uh, you know, infiltrating into uh, many parts, if not most parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and the third is really how much we're actually allocating for research and development. If, if we take a look at, you know, how Singapore is actually spending close to $2,000 on a per person basis for R&D uh, per year, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Indonesia is only allocating about $34 per person for R&D purposes uh, per year. Uh, that, that basically tells you why Singapore is the way it is and why Indonesia is the way it is. But, but I'm actually optimistic uh, that at the rate that, you know, we're starting from a low base in terms of collecting taxes and how tax revenue compares with the GDP. 
uh, I think uh, we're, we're, we're going to be able to basically broaden and deepen the tax, uh, if not the fiscal space, so that we could actually be not only spending uh, on the government side more money on research and development, but we could actually be catalyzing the private sector to be spending a lot more on education and research and development. And if, if we take a look at the, the next page, This is basically an illustration of the fiscal space of the, the different countries in Southeast Asia. I want to highlight, uh, you know, the main four in Southeast Asia, i.e. Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. Uh, you know, uh, Singapore is dealing with the COVID-19 uh, in a big way. They're allocating 19% of their GDP uh, for the COVID-19. A dollar amount uh, would be about 65 billion U.S., uh, dollars. Uh, Indonesia, unfortunately, is only allocating about 2.5%. Uh, that comes up to about $26 billion. Malaysia, they're doing about 20% of their GDP for purposes of uh, basically making sure that there is a broad-based economic recovery. Uh, Dollar-wise, they're spending $63 billion. And Thailand is sp spending $64 billion, which equates about 11.2% of their GDP. Uh, and, and I think it's clear from, from how the different countries in Southeast Asia uh, are spending for purposes of uh, basically uh, making sure that there's economic recovery in each country. Uh, I think it's clear uh, that, you know, there's likely to be different, uh, a different uh, outlook uh, in, in each country of the 10 countries in Southeast Asia in terms of how they're actually not only going to be ready uh, with, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with everything to, to survive, but uh, some may actually be able to, to be a winner at the rate that they're actually spending and splurging more than some other countries. Uh, on the lower on the side of the presentation, uh, we, can take a, we can take a look at how they're actually splicing uh, the spending from a fiscal standpoint uh, for social security, for small, medium enter uh, enterprises, and also for corporations. Uh, Singapore is allocating a, a big amount for social security or social safety net purposes. They're also allocating 59% of the stimulus for the corporations. Uh, the, the Thailand is also allocating 28% for social safety net purposes and 43% uh, for the corporations. Again, I say Indonesia is uh, at the moment uh, solely, if not uh, more uh, focused on, on the social safety nets and the small medium uh, with no allocation at all for the corporations. So the corporations actually correlate with the, you know, how we're going to be ready on the supply side of the game uh, going forward at the rate that the corporations are not getting stimulated at the moment. Uh, I think there's likely to be some permanent impairment with respect to the, the supply side of the game with some countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, next, if we take a look at uh, the, you know, I, tourism, I think is, is, is a low hanging fruit. Uh, unfortunately, it is the first thing that got hit, uh, you know, by way of COVID-19. Uh, we take a look at how the different countries in Southeast Asia have been able to generate uh, revenues from tourism. Uh, Thailand basically generated, uh, you know, in 2018, 9.6% uh, of their GDP from tourism by way of getting, you know, 35 million people to visit uh, Thailand. Uh, Indonesia, unfortunately, only uh, rakes in about 1.9% of its GDP from tourism. Uh, and Singapore at 4%, Malaysia at 4.8%, the Philippines uh, at 12.4%, and Vietnam at 6%. Uh, but, you know, on, on a dollar, uh, you know, amount basis, uh, we can compare any of these Southeast Asian countries with Spain, which I think has been a rock star in terms of being able to get, you know, double their population as tourist arrivals uh, and also generating massive amounts of, uh, you know, foreign exchange uh, at $78 billion for, you know, in 2019. Uh, but that, that only still makes up uh, only 5.4% as much as they would have been able to get $78 billion. Uh, so I think this is an area where not only we're going to be able to basically, uh, you know, create fiscal and monetary stability, but this is an area where actually Southeast Asia is going to be able to create lots of jobs. Uh, and, and the more jobs we can create, uh, uh, the, the, the more stability we can actually uh, attain uh, going forward. 
Uh, next. Uh, it is uh, an illustration of how each uh, of the large ASEAN or Southeast Asian countries uh, has been able to attract FDI. On the top part of this page is an illustration of how Indonesia has been able to attract FDI from 2010. We were able to get $16 billion. But if you see in the last maybe five, six, seven years, uh, things have been plateauing at about 28 to $29 billion with uh, some anomaly in 2017 at about $32 billion. Uh, and if we take a look at the lower page, uh, uh, the lower part of the page, uh, Singapore has basically been able to get $18,700 of FDI per, per, per person. Uh, this is this is uh, remarkable how they've been able to get you know a lot of dollars on a per capita basis from overseas uh, as compared to Malaysia at about two hundred seventy one dollars uh, and the Philippines Indonesia and Thailand at uh, at the low end of uh, the range at about ninety to ninety one dollars so Indonesia has only been getting about ninety one dollars worth of FDI per person. Uh, and, and as much as the Philippines is almost equal to that of Indonesia, uh, I think the big difference is that the Philippines, uh, you know, they have been able to basically uh, repatriate a significant amount of foreign reserve, I mean, foreign exchange uh, by way of uh, their foreign workers working in many countries around the world, uh, in Southeast Asia, in Hong Kong, in the Middle East, and also uh, in, in, in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, and they actually bring back on an annual basis about $35 billion uh, of uh, worth of foreign exchange, whereas the Indonesian foreign workers or the Indonesians working overseas uh, only bring back about 11 to $12 billion. So that, that I think speaks of, of uh, the level of education of uh, the Indonesians and the level of education of the Filipinos that are actually working overseas. Uh, if we go to the next page, Next. Uh, this basically uh, talks about, if, uh, if we go back, if, yeah. Okay, this is basically an illustration of the fiscal space of the different countries. Uh, I, I, can, I can safely assume and conclude uh, that, you know, as much as we went through the Asian financial crisis in 1998, uh, the fiscal space and the monetary space of, uh, you know, uh, Asian countries or ASEAN countries, uh, I think, are much more robust uh, compared to what we had in 1998. Uh, yes, Indonesia has a, a lower uh, f a fiscal space than it should be, but it, it stands at, at a, you know, at $130 billion worth of uh, tax collection. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's enough of a fiscal space to, as to basically create, uh, you know, uh, resilience and vigilance uh, in dealing with, with the crisis. And also from a monetary space standpoint, uh, uh, we have also, uh, we're, we're also seeing Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines and Malaysia and Singapore uh, and Vietnam hovering at uh, much higher levels compared to whatever monetary spaces or foreign exchange reserves uh, that we would have looked at 10 or 20 years ago. Next. Uh, this is the Gini ratio chart, which I, I like to show to people. Uh, and this depicts uh, the Gini ratio for the US, uh, which is at about 49 and China at about 47 the Philippines at about 44, and Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam basically hovering between 36 to, 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 to 40. Uh, it, it is not great, uh, but, but I do think that you know, most ASEAN countries or Southeast Asian countries uh, in the range of you know, 33 to 44, uh, I think are still manageable. And, and I do believe uh, that you know, they have the wherewithal to basically manage uh, the numbers down. And, and I do believe that you know, managing Gini ratios down in the future is gonna be uh, you know, relevant uh, with uh, respect to how we can actually maintain peace and stability uh, in, in ASEAN. Uh, next, the last piece is basically the increasing decoupling between China and the US. Uh, we are going through an episode. Next, please.
we're going through an episode which uh, you know many people have called uh, as the Thucydides trap. Uh, as you know, Thucydides was an Athenian general who basically warned his boss that uh, at any point or at any time when a rising power is uh, basically posing a challenge to you know, a pre-existing number one power, but declining. Uh, that's what people have referred to as a Thucydides uh, trap. And we're seeing that between China and uh, the United States. I presented uh, the GDP figures of a number of regions here uh, on a PPP adjusted basis. I know it's a bit misleading, but, but I think uh, this is to basically underline the point that, you know, Asia or Asian economies have basically gone back to where they were uh, in the first 1800 years uh, in the last two millennia. So if we go back to year zero until year 1800, uh, pretty much uh, you know, the Asian economies were actually a lot more dominant than the European economy uh, and or uh, the US economy. It's only been the last 200 years that the US economy has been more dominant uh, than the Asian economies. But uh, as we're seeing in the last few years, China, India and ASEAN and Japan uh, have pretty much spiked up to the point that the accumulation of all these Asian economies are actually larger than the accumulation of both the U.S. economy and the Western European economy. So this is, this is the episode that's been referred to uh, as the Thucydides trap. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, time will tell as to how the two superpowers are going to be able to coexist and treat and deal with each other uh, in the near foreseeable future and beyond. Now, if we go to the next page, I do want to highlight that, you know, as much as China has been a major global or if not globalizing power. Next, please. China, uh, unfortunately, experienced a, a negative uh, current account uh, um, balance uh, last year. Uh, and it is probably likely to go through another current account deficit in the year 2020 uh, by way of the COVID-19. Uh, so it's, it's key for China to actually be able to, uh, of course, create a surplus again like they have for the past 30 years uh, by way of being the factory for the world, by way of uh, being able to create massive amounts of international currency in their current account. Uh, to the extent that they're not going to be able to create sustained, you know, positive current account balances going forward, they're going to have to basically work on popularizing uh, their currency. And, and unfortunately, their currency, the renminbi, renminbi or the yuan, uh, you know, uh, serves only about 1.66% of the global SWIFT transactions. So to the extent that they want to actually globalize their sphere of influence, uh, be it the soft power, be it the Belt and Road Initiative, be it uh, infrastructure development, or be it anything, uh, I, I think they, they do have to take a look at two things, uh, strategically or tactically. They've got to basically take a view on the current account uh, as to make it positive again, so that they could actually internationalize their economic activities or they could actually uh, further popularize their currency so that their currency is actually uh, an accepted uh, you know, uh, uh, currency uh, of tender uh, so that they could actually uh, you know, externalize their influence to the rest of the world uh, a lot better, a lot more effectively. Next page. This is an illustration of uh, the debt to GDP of China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the US. Uh, they're you know, at around 300 something percent uh, if you combine both the public and the private debts for each country. Uh, and on the right-hand side of the page, you know, I've illustrated uh, basically their, their, their energy uh, view taking uh, on a per capita basis. Uh, basically, the U.S. Uh, has some advantage because the energy production on a per capita basis is still uh, a lot greater than the uh, energy consumption on a per capita basis. Vis-a-vis -vis in China, the energy production is only slightly uh, above the energy production, uh, the energy consumption on a per capita basis. Now, on the lower hand side, uh, we take a look at how they're going to be able to feed themselves going forward. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has a bit of an advantage because uh, they basically uh, can produce on a per capita basis much more food than, than they need to consume uh, as compared to China, which is just marginally uh, slightly higher 
uh, in producing as compared to what they need to consume. So I, I think all these factors, uh, you know, the, the two countries' current account balances, the two countries' uh, you know, currencies, uh, and the two countries' uh, energy uh, consumption and production on a per capita basis, and the two countries' agricultural production and consumption on a per capita basis, will basically fall into the equation of, of, of how they're actually going to be able to deal with each other. Uh, as the increasing decoupling uh, were to take place uh, going forward. So the, the last page I just want to highlight uh, in terms of how ASEAN or Southeast Asian countries have fared thus far. Uh, I think it's important for ASEAN to continue thriving in a robust manner uh, if, if ASEAN basically takes a hard look on basically being able to improve its marginal productivity and being able to improve its financial inclusion and being able to basically focus on the low hanging fruit such as tourism and investments or foreign direct investments. And of course, last but not least, uh, being able to focus uh, on uh, reducing inequality or reducing uh, Gini ratio. So net net, uh, we've had a pretty cool, uh, you know, two millennia of relative peace, you know, I get I get I get concerned when you know my my friends from other places you know basically uh, you know tell me that you know we can't keep ourselves together we can't get our act together you know we tend to be you know hostile with each other but if if we compare the the, the number of casualties that would have been had in in the first two world wars in a span of only forty years you know we had more than one hundred thirty million people killed in the two world wars and that is a far cry from you know, whatever casualties that would have, we would have experienced in the last 2000 years. So net net, we've been a pretty stable, peaceful region. And, and I think we've got a good shot, a really good future going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pagita. I think we all agree that's a very comprehensive presentation. Um, we learned all the way from the history of Southeast Asian countries the attribute um, post-COVID, and that um, the number are staggering, but it's, it's really interesting to learn about that um, from the slowing down of economic growth all the way to inequality risings, as well as the different marginal productivity each countries within the ASEAN um, region has. Um, you also touch upon the decoupling era um, where we see the um, bigger polarization within China and the US. And you sum it up very well in terms of the opportunities um, that the Southeast Asian country has, as well as the challenges that the countries has to tackle in averaging the situations. And very excited to um, uh, the discussions we're gonna have. Uh, and I'm sure our audience already have plenty of burning questions. With that, we'll start with the q and sessions. Eric? All right, I see that we've got tons of questions in the chat box. Um, I'll start with the first one from Pratama here. Pratama asked about the fact that back in the 98 and, and 10 years ago, a decade ago in 2008, uh, I think SMEs has always been profoundly hit due to the, their vulnerability. Um, now, Patama highlighted the fact that the government has indeed allocated a lot of money to help the SME. However, the actual number of realization is still low. So, Pagita, according to your opinion, what do you think is the best policy response to, to this fact? Well, I, I, I think that's, that's a very uh, accurate uh, observation. I mean, the, the actual realization of uh, disbursement for the small medium entrepreneurs uh, as of two weeks ago would have been only 0.06% of the target. Uh, I think the government has swiftly uh, responded uh, when some people were making comments about it uh, by way of uh, making the disbursement to the banks. Uh, so that the banks could actually be helpful in increasing uh, the piping of the money uh, all the way down to the small medium entrepreneurs. Uh, but, but, but I think, uh, you know, uh, the long answer of this uh, would be that 
the, the piping, I think, needs to be rejigged. It needs to be uh, remedied. Uh, we don't have enough pipes that actually go down from the top to the bottom. Uh, and, and I'm actually quite uh, positive uh, with respect to the prospect of uh, using digital uh, technology capabilities so that we could actually transfer uh, the funds uh, to um, the, the lowest levels of the economy, be it for the entrepreneurs, but it, 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 it should also be for, you know, social safety nets. And, and I do believe that at the rate that everybody in Indonesia has a hand phone, uh, there's, there's no reason for anybody in Indonesia not to be able to receive anything digitally. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been uh, empowered uh, nor uh, utilized yet. But, but I, I do believe that if the government were to engage uh, that sort of uh, you know, technological capability, uh, I think we're going to see a much higher uh, realization of the disbursement uh, in the near foreseeable future. Okay, and I think this is kind of related to that question from William. He's asking, um, what are some of the investment opportunities you're seeing in terms of the private market in Fiji and PE post-COVID in Indonesia and ASEAN in general? Um, he's asking about the, the sort of sectors you think will become more prevalent. Well, I, 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 would, I would go with the first principles, right? Uh, and, and one of the first principles would be that this uh, economy, the Indonesian economy, uh, if the question is about Indonesia, the Indonesian economy uh, basically hinges on a very high consumptive propensity. So, you know, 55 to 60 percent of the economy basically is uh, consumption. Uh, and at the rate that demographically, demographically we're going to continue being youthful, uh, I, I do believe that I think there's a good chance of Indonesia's being consumptive uh, continuously for the next at least 10 to 15 years. So anything that's within that space of consumption uh, would be good for anybody to, to take a look at, you know, uh, in terms of an investment thesis. Uh, and secondly, uh, the, the financial inclusion, I've highlighted that the financial inclusion in Indonesia is only 49%. So anything that's going to be helpful in moving the needle up from 49% to a much higher number, uh, I think would provide significant business opportunities. So Number three, I'll just highlight, uh, you know, I think the guys that are going to survive through COVID-19 anywhere are, are those that actually have been able to use, uh, you know, a, a virtual uh, type of uh, mindset or paradigm. Uh, so you, I would pick on anything that's going to be in financial inclusion or increasing financial inclusion. I would pick uh, anything that's going to be within the consumer face, uh, space, and I would pick anything that's got the wherewithal to basically adapt, uh, you know, as to embrace a much more virtual, if not digital paradigm. Can I just, uh, probably just a follow up from me. Um, do you see um, this financial inclusion being driven by technology companies or will you see the role of government oh, yeah. or the old bank? No, I, I, uh, I, I think the role of the, the, the tech companies is going to be, uh, really, really big. Uh, and, and, you know, some of the right hailing companies here, uh, I think, have an eye on basically peer to peer lending. Uh, and some of the even travel tech companies and other tech companies, I think, have an eye on how we can actually get money into the hands of everyone. And uh, the, the cool thing about it is, you know, everybody's got a handphone and our, our internet penetration uh, is, is, moving up faster than ever. So at the rate that you are penetrated digitally and technologically, uh, and you've got the right connectivity, uh, you know, uh, then I think uh, it's, it's pretty robust, the opportunity. Very interesting, Pargita. Um, I think we have a question next from Kukusis Woyo. He was asking about the fact Hello? that there are news about recent multilateral agreements between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, this growth triangle. What is your general opinion on this sort of multilateral agreement within some subset of countries in ASEAN and whether this would help in terms of you know, recovery? I'm, I'm actually more bullish uh, on, on a regional type of multilateral uh, you know, framework. Uh, 
uh, as compared to a much broader uh, multilateral. Uh, and and I, I want to tie that to the earlier point I was making about how conversations are actually getting a lot more polarized. So when conversations are getting more polarized, uh, protectionism is on the rise. And when protectionism is on the rise, people tend to bilateralize more than multilateralize. Uh, and, and at the rate that we've got to bilateralize with anybody that's got a higher marginal productivity, uh, we are exposed. We're coming to the table with a position of weakness. And, and unfortunately, Indonesia has a marginal productivity of only twenty-three dollars to $24,000. So you can imagine if we were to bilateralize with somebody out there who's got a marginal productivity of above $100,000, uh, we're basically exposed, right? But if we were to multilateralize with like a Thailand or Malaysia, uh, I think it's a lot easier to just uh, concoct some sort of a framework that is reflective of the cultural understanding of each other, but also the economic understanding of each other. So I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic with respect to a multilateral arrangement with uh, countries like Malaysia and Thailand. I'm not saying that it's been perfect. You know, we've had uh, some framework on rubber uh, and, you know, sometimes countries tend to get a little bit selfish uh, at times, so they don't do what they say they're going to do, uh, but it's okay. Uh, I, I still see this as, uh, as an episode that's still within reasonable boundaries. I just want to build on top of that. You mentioned about the fact that there is an increasing trend towards polarization, and this might eventually end up in the fact that production of certain things like manufacturing will you know, reshort, reshoring of manufacturing, do you think such a threat is a mere narrative or would it actually take place? Would productions be eventually localized in the end? I, I don't think it's going to happen quickly and easily uh, because if, if, if you're a multinational company, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, you, 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 you built the, the factory in China because it was easy because it was cheap, right? And if, if at the end of the day, if you're the CEO of multinational company that needs to decide on relocating, you've got to make sure that you relocate to a place that's going to be as cheap, as efficient, and as effective uh, to the extent that it's not going to be, then you've got to be able to explain that to the shareholders and the board, right? So I, I, I don't think it is straightforward. And plus, you've got to think about the whole supply chain, right? Uh, you're, you're probably just producing one part of the whole supply chain. So you've got to figure out as to whether or not the other parts of the supply chain are going to be moving with you to the extent they're not moving, then your shipping, transportation, and everything uh, else uh, would, would basically, you know, have, a, have a, an effect on your total cost structure. Okay. So um, next question is from Henry. Uh, this is about inequality. I think he's mentioned that he saw your post that you recommend one of the book from Joseph Stiglitz. I think Stiglitz are pretty much very famous um, in highlighting the inequality in the U.S. So um, he did mention in the book that the recovery crisis during the 2008 um, financial crisis, 91% of the recovery go to the top 1%. So he's asking, will this actually happen to ASEAN with this COVID crisis? And if yes, what should the government do to avoid that? Well, I, I hope not. Uh, and, and there's no disagreement with uh, the observation. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, if, if we take a look at the S&P 500, ever since the, you know, the Great Recession in 2008, uh, the S&P 500 has gone up pretty much over 250% right? Uh, whereas the, the U.S. economy has inflated in the last 12 years by only 40%. So right there, you know, the gap between the inflation of financial assets at more than 250% vis-a-vis the inflation of the real economy at about 40% explains why the top have gotten more than the bottom, right? And, and there, there's so many analysis, there's so many books about it. And, and I think to some extent that has also happened in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I can draw the same, uh, you know, comparison or analogy or analysis. The stock markets in Asia or in ASEAN uh, have gone up uh, by a higher proportion uh, than the real economies uh, in the ASEAN countries. So that in a way, I think, explains how 
you know, capitalism or capital has not been uh, equally, if not judiciously uh, distributed to everybody to the extent that only some have gotten more than more, more, more than proportional compared to uh, most others. Interesting. We have a question next from Grisel de Setia. He, she asked about, Pagita, what's your opinion about the increasing, you know, the current piling up of government debts among Southeast Asian countries, especially, you know, recently we've been raising a lot of, uh, selling a lot of bonds in, in the foreign markets. What's your opinion on that? I'm, I'm not worried. Uh, I think the argument that debt is is unhealthy. I mean, yes, debt is unhealthy if uh, you cannot service it, right? Uh, if, if we take a look at our public debt vis-a-vis uh, -vis the GDP, uh, the, the ratio is still healthily at below 30%, if at worst at about 30%. And if we compare the debt to GDP or the public debt to GDP ratio of Indonesia to even, you know, our neighboring countries, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, they're, they're way above 50%. You know, uh, even Singapore has a, you know, public debt to GDP a ratio of much higher than 50%. So uh, does that pose a concern to Singapore? Uh, not really, because Singapore is, is a thriving economy and it knows how to basically convince the world that it can service it's dead. So at the end of the day, the creditors basically will just have to size up as to whether or not the guy that's borrowing or the country that's borrowing has the wherewithal to service it. So uh, I'm, I'm of the view that even if we were to increase our public debt to GDP from 30% to even 40 to 50% uh, at the risks of basically widening the deficit, uh, I'm, I'm still convinced that, you know, Indonesia would still be able to service the debt. Uh, and, and because of the, the robust nature uh, of the Indonesian economy. And what we've got to make sure is we can actually create a bigger fiscal space. So you basically have to promote the entrepreneurship so the entrepreneurship uh, gets more robust and, and their business activities expand so that they can actually pay more taxes. You actually have an opportunity to lower the tax rates while you're actually expanding the tax base. Right, so I, I see a future where actually Indonesia uh, might be, you know, seeing a tax rate of only 15%, if not less. Right now, you know, they're paying 25 to 30%. So again, uh, I'm not worried about the, the, the current levels of debt. Uh. Okay, actually, um I'm pretty curious about, do you see the fact that all these um, Southeast Asian countries are able to raise um, debt during the crisis as the fault for confidence in terms of the potential of the region for the futures? Yes, I, I, I do. Uh, and and I, I say this on the back of two things, okay? Uh, if we were to go out to the market, uh, I don't think we're going to be isolated. I don't think we're going to be shunned. I think people will basically listen to what we're saying and, and they're likely to lend us more money. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, the, the, the world is thriving on a back of massive amounts of liquidity. If we take a look at the amount of liquidity that's around the, the world right now, it's, uh, it's probably around $100 trillion. Uh, if, if you add up all the M1s and M2s and M0s, uh, and a hundred trillion dollars, uh, they need to be basically invested somewhere. So at the moment, we're seeing some episodes of money or liquidity actually fleeing to, uh, you know, uh, good quality instruments or good quality destinations, right? Yes, you're seeing the lowering of the treasury yield to around 0.6%. Uh, it used to be above 2%, you know, a couple of years ago or three years ago. Uh, that's because so much liquidity is actually chasing higher quality instruments because it's rated AAA uh, at the expense of the lower rated instruments. Uh, and Indonesia is only rated BBB. Uh, it's only an, an, an investment grade instrument. So, but there's so much liquidity in the world that there's still going to be enough that's going to be chasing the less uh, good uh, instruments, um, including countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam, and Malaysia. Well, Malaysia is better rated than we are, but the Philippines and Indonesia are equally rated. Cool. On that point, Pagita, could you give a bit of comment on the fact that Indonesia has recently moved up to the upper middle 
economy level of state. Does, does this have anything to do perhaps with the narrative that you just shared with us? No, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's got to do with a much broader uh, um, story of, of, of what we have gone through in the last many years or few years. Uh, we've been able to basically show prudence uh, from a fiscal standpoint. Uh, we've been able to show prudence from a monetary standpoint. Uh, and we've been able to show both, you know, macroeconomic stability, uh, fiscal sustainability and, and, you know, monetary stability. So those are, I think, uh, the, the main reasons as to why we've, we've bumped up a little bit, you know, on, on the status. Uh, but do I, am I complacent? Am I happy? Am I content with just being a triple B and, 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 and a, a more, uh, or a higher, you know, middle income country? Uh, no, uh, I, I think we've got to shoot for the stars. I, I think we've got, you know, reason to basically aspire for being a triple A country. And that's, that's not entirely impossible. Totally agree. I think we can't wait for that to happen in near futures. Um, so next questions, um, slightly on a different note. So this is from Brian. He asks, what do you think about vaccine development as the key to, um, to end up the crisis? Because what, from what he knows, the government do not allocate enough spending in local alternative of vaccines or similar medications to reduce fatality rate. Well, I mean, you mean in Southeast Asia? Uh, I mean, there hasn't yeah. been any vaccine, right? So uh, we're probably not going to see any vaccine until the earliest around the end of the year. I mean, it's got to be tested again and again and again. So if, if, if the question relates to vaccination for Indonesia, uh, I think the fundamental issue with vaccination uh, is that once it's actually discovered and, you know, officialized or validated, it's got to go through the phase of, you know, mass production. Then it's got to go through the phase of commercialization. Uh, then it's got to go through the phase of uh, basically distribution. And at each phase, uh, each one of these phases, uh, there's going to be uh, those that are not going to be able to get it. You know, either they can't afford it or there's no truck or car that can actually deliver it to the remote areas of places like, you know, Indonesia and some other countries in Southeast Asia. So uh, until then, I think uh, businesses are exposed at the rate that they're not getting the necessary stimulus uh, from the government. Uh, and and it's, it's a real risk because at the end of the day, do we want to be a winner or do we want to just be average, right? So if there's a risk or a, a, a visible risk of moving or shifting from temporary impairment to a permanent impairment, uh, then we're not likely to be winners. I think that's the point I was trying to make earlier. So I'm just being mindful of time here right now. We are supposed to end at uh, 60th minutes, but I think if you don't mind, Pagita, maybe we could discuss two more questions. If you're okay. sure. All right. So let's see. Um, okay, we'll take a question from Andy here. Andy mentioned about the fact that there is a high level of penetration that China's Belt and Road Initiative has been taking in, in the recent, you know, days. What, what is your opinion on this? strategy from China in general, I and mean, how should ASEAN cope with this Belt and Road? Well, I, not, not only is it a remake of what we saw in the 14th century, but I think it's an augmentation because it takes care of the maritime narrative, right? Uh, back then, there was no maritime narrative as much as you know, China wants to see it now and going forward. But, but I, I would go back to one of the pages I showed. At the end of the day, they want to basically internationalize this narrative They've got to figure out a way to fund it. And so far, they've been funding it in U.S. dollars or uh, international currency. Uh, but then you take a look at the current account. If they go through a negative or a current account deficit, they're not going to be able to pile up enough international currency to fund the externalizing initiative, right? So if, if that were the case, uh, then they've got to figure out a way to fund the initiative using their own currency. 
Uh, and, and the way to do that is to actually popularize the renminbi. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I showed you the figure, right? Uh, renminbi only makes up about 1.66% of the total SWIFT cross-border transactions globally. So uh, I think there's one, one really cool way about, you know, uh, circumventing this inhibition or limitation. Uh, the digital technology, I mean, at the rate that, you know, the, the, the Alipays and the WePays of the world are, are actually crossing the borders of China uh, into uh, Southeast Asian countries. And to the extent that we can actually accept, you know, renminbi as, as payment, uh, you know, uh, or currency for, for payment of goods and services, I think that will answer uh, the answer, uh, the, the question. All right, I think this will be the last questions. Um, I'll pick the lucky one. Uh, I think there's a questions from um, Tamara. And it's kind of relevant with the one um, on our last question, which is from Yono. I think they are asking about the financial stimulus that the government, I think in particular Indonesian government has released. And you are, um, you have been talking about uh, releasing more um, than the current 400 trillion groups, like 10 times more than that. Um, I think you're suggesting like a 4,000. No, four times, four times. Four times. Sorry. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you know, at, at some point I was, I was saying 4,000, but the, the, the essential uh, number would have been 1,600 trillions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I think the question is in that stimulus, um, do you see What's your, your thoughts on that in supporting people's life? Um, Tamar is asking, um, uh, does this will, won't make of inflations? And Yono are asking more into, um, will you see the stimulus goes to corporations? Because you do mention in your presentations that um, most of Indonesian spending are focuses on SMEs and the, the social securities. So what's, what's yeah. your thought on that? Uh, I, I think you've got to take a look at how this virus has uh, inflicted upon us. Okay, it has inflicted upon humanity on a non-discriminatory basis. It, it, you know, it disregards color of skin, race, religion, power, physical strength, or whatever. Everybody would have been exposed. And as a matter of principle, I think the counter policy or the policy response should be non-discriminatory it cannot be discriminatory uh yes i've i've been saying that i think we should prioritize uh you know the social safety nets uh, for the lowest of the pyramid uh secondly we should prioritize the state-owned entities but it cannot be at the expense of not allocating anything for the corporations because at the end of the day everybody pays taxes right and if everybody pays taxes, at the end of the day, we've got to basically make sure and secure uh, the fiscal space for the future. But if the corporations are discriminated against just on the basis of thinking that they can take care of themselves, I think that's, that's a fallacy. Uh, that's a misplaced argument. Uh, I, I don't think corporations can fix things by themselves uh, because of the fiscal distancing. Lots of people have had to close their hotels. Lots of people have had to close their factories. Uh, yes, they can afford maybe a few months uh, worth of salaries, but they've got to survive beyond then. So uh, I, I, I think that's the first principle. I think it's got to be non-discriminatory in terms of sequencing and prioritizing. Yes, we can prioritize uh, the, the, the lowest levels of the pyramid. The second observation I want to make is that, you know, the, the 405 trillion rupees, which has gone up to now 630 to potentially 690, I just think it's simply not enough, you know, if we want to take care of both the supply side of the game and the demand side of the game. And the demand side of the game is to make sure that people that cannot go to the factories and people that cannot actually cut hair, people cannot, who cannot, you know, do acupuncture therapies and all that, they've got to make a living. They've got to live and they've got to be able to buy food and drinks and they need to be supported for, for at least six months. That amounts to about 100 trillion rupees per month. Multiply that with six months, that's already 600 trillions. Then you've got to make sure that the healthcare capabilities are enough so that everyone has the N95s, the ventilators, the vitamin Cs, and all that good stuff. That adds up to about three to 400 trillion rupees, not the 75 to 87 trillions that's been announced and allocated by the government. Then right there, you, you've got 1,000 trillions already. Then you've got to make sure that the supply side of the game 
right? The earlier part was just the, 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 the demand side of the game. The supply side, you've got to make sure that those guys that own factories, hotels, and restaurants, and whatever, they've got the necessary working capital. That's easily three to 600 million, uh, three to 600 trillion rupees for the next six months at least. So I think, I think 1,600 trillions, and that's been my number since early February, and I've been very consistent about it. Unfortunately, it's fallen on deaf ears. Right. Thank you, Pagita. I think that summarizes our talk today well. So we would, again, would like to thank you, Pagita, so much for all of the insight that you have provided to us in, in, to the global trends that are currently happening. And we would also like to thank all of you who have attended this webinar and posed really great questions. We have to apologize that we could not address every single question that you might have put, but please do join us in the future for our webinar and help us fill in the feedback form as well. Yeah, so we have, um, yeah, so we have a very short feedback form. Um, we, um, I think Edward already posted the link in the form and it's shown in the screen as well. Um, so we will also send a link to all of you who registered. So we'll really love to hear your thoughts and what we can improve for our next event. So please do help us to fill it in. And I think that's all. So thank you for all who are tuning in today. And thank you again, Pak Gita. Um, for thank you. It's a real honor. It's a real honor. Cool. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all. So see you in the next events from us. Bye, guys. Bye.